Greg, thanks for coming in and spending time uh, with us today uh, talking about your work. Uh, before we get there, though, I wanted to uh, take a minute to set that up by um, asking you a little bit about your own professional trajectory and uh, what you did before you came to uh, the UCI School of Education. Sure. Well, I started out at Michigan for 25 years, and there I worked at the um, Survey Research Center, um, working on and ultimately running the panel study of income dynamics, uh, and then went to Northwestern into the School of Education there. It was a research appointment at uh, Michigan. Um, and I was there for 13 years, uh, and then uh, I heard the sirens calling from uh, UCI. Deborah Vandell was uh, just starting up a new PhD program. Uh, and uh, I had a chance to help build up a new PhD program without being dean, which was a, a big plus. Um, but, you know, she had a vision that, uh, that I shared for what a PhD program in education should look like. Um, so I jumped aboard and uh, I've been here for almost 10 years now. Yeah, so say a little bit more about what that vision uh, for PhD education it was all about and what makes UCI School of Education special on that dimension? Um, well, it's really the idea that I think education schools should be the most exciting places on campus. Uh, the disciplines um, tend to burrow very deeply into their subject matter and um, schools like the School of Education um, go broad, uh, uh, taking insights from psychology and economics and sociology uh, and trying to uh, channel them in ways that are going to help disadvantaged kids uh, in, in our country and and around the world. Um, and you know we are keenly aware, probably better than almost anyone, about how um, uh, how disadvantaged uh, kids are with respect to their educational opportunities. How important it is to have an education these days. And it's really up to us in education schools to come up with solutions. Uh, and solutions, I think, come from um, uh, collaborative uh, research and discussions uh, across a number of disciplines to try to develop um, ideas that um, are, are more creative than what come out of the disciplines because they're more interdisciplinary. Uh, and that, that vision I very much share. Yeah, and um... Yeah, I was going to push you to say just a little bit more about uh, how exceptional this place is. So when I came here from New York University, from um, uh, I, you know, one of the reasons I came was because you were here, Jackie Eccles was here, all these great disciplinary scholars were here, and um, and in an education school. So uh, how would you? How would you describe that kind of faculty expertise to a, a, a broader audience uh, that might be f not familiar with those names? Well, it's a, it's a pretty strong cast of characters, right? Uh, Jackie Eccles has really um, developed uh, central ideas about academic motivation uh, and has uh, had a very ambitious research program about that for, for 40 years. Um, George Farkas was a very strong uh, sociology of education person. Um, you know, I could work through the list, but I think what, there are a number of strong people in education schools around the country, but what sets uh, UCI apart is that they talk to one another. Right? Usually you have this balkanized kind of structure where there's one group doing urban education, another group doing teaching and learning, and another group. So, uh, and they're off doing their own thing. They're admitting their own students. They're talking amongst themselves. And um, that, that's not the right way to do it. And the vision that Deborah had um, that we, I wholeheartedly support and we tried to um, enact and now we try to maintain is this idea that uh, there ought to be collaborations across uh, areas. There ought to be training opportunities across areas. We very much encourage graduate students to um, combine um, work in a number of different areas in the school. And we very much encourage that because it's all 
for the purpose of developing something that wouldn't have been developed had it been coming out of a very narrow area. Yeah, and I, I don't have your CV in front of me, but uh, I know it well enough to, to state, you know, virtually all your work is done in collaboration, right, with, uh, often with, with faculty at the school and, and doctoral students at the school. Um, can you speak a little bit about uh, why, why that's important to you, these, these kind of collaborations? It's how I do work. You know, it's what's fun. It's what makes a, an academic career um, very satisfying and very exciting to me. So uh, some of it is the, the students. Uh, you first work with students and try to train them with basic skills, but you often discover students have uh, expertise and interests that, uh, that you learn from, and you try to go with that, right, and develop uh, projects together and really try to take it somewhere. Um, one of our more recent faculty hires, Drew Bailey, uh, is a cognitive psychologist. And um, he came, what, three years ago, maybe four years ago. And uh, he's been my closest collaborator in the last several years. We have a lot of uh, mutual interests. Uh, we've developed uh, a lot of papers together. We've worked with a lot of graduate students. so. You know, being willing to um, talk to people who come from different areas and engage with ideas and try to cook up something, you know, that's, that's what an education school can do well, but you've got to make the effort and you need to try to attract faculty who are going to also make the effort. And so when we do our recruiting, um, both of graduate students as well as faculty, it's one thing that I emphasize that, you know, this is a place where you can come and talk to a lot of different people and really try to cook up interesting things. Well, uh, let's focus a little bit on the collaboration you're doing with uh, Drew Bailey and uh, I think Jade Jenkins is involved in some of that and, and others uh, on early childhood education uh, because uh, your work in that area, you're uh, challenging what's become a little bit of a, a, a conventional paradigm in this uh, about um, how to think about early childhood education. Can you, uh, can you describe a little bit uh, sure. uh, what you're finding? You now, we didn't start out to challenge, uh, but there is this view that dollars spent on early childhood education are going to pay off handsomely uh, with kids who are doing better in school, who earn more when they turn uh, adults, who commit less crime, and so forth. And there are some very famous studies um, that show that. But those were run in the 1960s and 1970s when conditions were very different. They were very um, hothouse kind of programs run by the researchers themselves. So you really wonder to what extent uh, early education programs today, like Head Start and pre-K programs, um, can uh, replicate the kind of uh, very strong effects that, uh, that those early programs showed. Um, so we've, um, we've been trying to look over the literature, synthesize it, but we're especially interested in the problem that um, even though these early education settings often do a pretty good job of boosting reading and math skills of kids by the end of the pre-K year, um, they then go off into elementary school and, um, and the other kids quickly catch up, right? So it's not just a matter of being successful during the pre-K year. It's a much broader problem of getting the, the K-12 systems involved with the early education systems to think how can we integrate the kind of learning goals that you have in pre-K with the learning goals that you've got in kindergarten, first grade, and second grade, um, so that the kind of gains that you get in pre-K aren't lost. And, um, and you know, the evidence, the balance of the evidence is that we now have this misalignment that uh, for the Head Start program and for a number of the pre-Ks where you do have evidence about what happens after kids leave the pre-K classrooms. Um, you quickly find that these advantages that kids have coming into the kindergarten classrooms are lost. The, the, the kids who weren't in pre-K catch up. So, you know, it's a tough 
Tough and, job for, stu for teachers to uh, both ensure that the kids who don't know the skills get them and make sure the kids who mm -hmm. come in with the skills um, build on those over the course of the year. And, and uh, just to make sure uh, uh, I've got this right, the, the hypothesis is that they're, uh, these, these waning effects are due to all the diverse influences that uh, uh, also are responsible for uh, children's uh, uh, educational pathways. The, um, the summer setback that people worry about, the peer, peer and family effects, the community effects. Uh, um, is, that, is that, that the argument or is that the, that the initial test, uh, the initial um, uh, measures of growth uh, themselves were uh, somehow suspect. I think the the most important problem is that when kids come out of a pre-K setting or a Head Start setting, um, knowing more of their letters and numbers and have other kind of uh, school readiness skills, that um, they go into kindergarten classrooms where the teachers are teaching those skills to the kids who weren't in Head Start or pre-K, right? So kids are learning very rapidly during age four, age five, and so forth, right? So you're getting um, the kind of growth in the basics in kindergarten for the kids who weren't in the programs. That's very rapid. That's what the kindergarten classrooms are set up to do, right? Um, and if you have a teacher who kind of checks the box and says, these kids already know this, let me concentrate on the ones who don't. You know, she should be, or he should be concentrating on the ones who don't, but at the same time, uh, you want to have a classroom that is taking the kids who already know the elementary um, numeracy and literacy kind of skills and building on those so that they're um, ending up you know, much further along at the end of uh, kindergarten and then that, that gets picked up in first grade and so forth. I mean, peer influences and neighborhood influences, things like that are, um, and family influences are certainly important determinants of overall trajectories as you go through K-12 schooling. But this particular problem, I think, is more this mismatch between what's learned uh, in the year before kindergarten and what kindergarten classrooms are like. And, um, you know, I know those diverse sets of, of influences is a topic that's uh, animated much of your career. Uh, where uh, you've, you've thought deeply about childhood poverty as well as uh, inequality. Um, uh, and uh, one of the pieces of that work that I think is uh, important to share out with a larger audience is this uh, uh, work you, you did recently with Russell Sage around um, the growing inequality in uh, early childhood access to opportunities uh, as well as outcomes. Could you speak a little bit uh, about that? Sure. Um, Dick Bernane and I were the uh, co-conspirators in, uh, uh, in this project that involved a lot of other um, authors of an edited book that we did and then we uh, called Wither Opportunity that Russell Sage published and then we did a book called uh, Restoring Opportunity that was jointly published by Russell Sage and Harvard Education Press. Uh, and it was a very broad look um, over the last 40 years. Uh, we know that in inequality has increased, income inequality has increased. And people had been focusing more on the kind of current generation impacts, but we were interested in to what extent growing inequality in the, the parent generation was being transmitted in terms of growing inequality uh, in the, the children who were growing up in those families and, uh, and going off on their own. And uh, one of the authors of, uh, uh, of a chapter in the Wither Opportunity book, Sean Reardon, put together this uh, amazing uh, time series showing gaps between high and low income um, children uh, in terms of test scores uh, over the last 50 years. And what you found was this uh, stark growth in the, the gap, earnings, uh, in the achievement gap that um, increased by about 50% between 1965 or so and in the early 2000s. Um, and 
if you then look at gaps in uh, college completion, for example, you get a similar kind of story. You know, it's a story where uh, achievement levels of low-income kids are increasing. Um, college completion rates of low-income kids are increasing. But the achievement growth and, uh, and college completion growth for higher-income kids is accelerating, right? So they're both making progress, but the progress at the top and the middle is much greater than the progress at the bottom, so that you have this growing gap. And, and, and I thought one of the most striking uh, figures was not just the, the the growing gap in uh, K twelve achievement and also college going, but that the gap in after school supplementary enrichment opportunities. Uh, right. So the the question is, how does income translate? How does growing income inequality translate into growing achievement inequality? Right. Um, and the evidence is somewhat circumstantial there, but uh, one of the developments that is probably important is that at the time there's been growing income inequality, there's been growing uh, residential segregation by income. So in the 2000s relative to 1970, uh, poor kids are much more likely to be surrounded by poor kids. Uh, middle class or rich kids are more likely to be surrounded by people in their social strata. And given the kind of local system of schooling that we have in the United States where kids tend to attend neighborhood schools, um, that, is, that translates into uh, schools increasingly concentrating either poor or affluent kids within the schools. Um, so that is part of the dynamic. Uh, but another part that we discovered that you referred to, if you simply look at the amount that uh, parents are spending out of their income on what you might think of as enrichment expenditures for their kids, things like child care, lessons, summer camp, computers, vacations, those are you know, opportunities for kids to be exposed to the outside world. Um, in the early 70s, that gap in current dollars was about $3,800 being spent per child per year by the, the top 20%. 3800 versus about 800. Uh, and if you roll forward to 10 years ago, that 800 had gone to about 1300, you know, an increase in uh, per child per year expenditures. But the, the 3000 figure had gone up to 10,000, right? So higher income families now are spending $10,000 per child per year on these enrichment <coughs> expenditures. Yeah. Opera, uh David Gresky, uh, who was, I was interacting with earlier this week, a sociologist from Stanford, calls these uh, opportunity markets, and that our educational system is in increasingly driven by people's uh, abilities to essentially purchase uh, educational opportunities and advantages for their children. Right, and God bless them. You know, we we want people to be spending money on behalf of their kids, but if you think about it in the broader context of uh, of inequality and of trying to ensure equal access to opportunities for a good education and a middle class job and so forth, ten thousand dollars per year is about what school districts spend on educating a child, right? So the higher income parents are matching ten thousand dollars that the schools are spending on their kids with ten thousand dollars that they're spending on their kids. Um, so if you actually look at these gaps that start quite large at kindergarten, um, they don't narrow after that. Um, you would hope that schools might be an equalizing agent in society, but um, when you've got higher income parents spending $10,000 per child per year, it's a kind of a strong current to be uh, rowing against. But for whatever reason, that gap starts large, You know, it's much bigger than it used to be, and it pretty much stays uh, large all the way through the end of high school. And, uh, of course, that was the, the rationale and logic for investing in these preschool programs, right? That right. you have to get them earlier to close the gap. Uh, Heckman and others arguing right. uh, there would be no, no better, more important investment than that. You, you've now conducted research that's skeptical of that. Well, it's, it's saying there's a potential for that. There's not a guarantee of it, right? And we have to be... Uh, very mindful of understanding what the process is by which those investments early on produce payoffs uh, into the future. And that's 
that's the link I think that uh, that someone like Jim Heckman doesn't really pay much attention to, and I think I think that's everything. And uh, and then there's this other uh, um, potential intervention uh, early in in uh, an individual's life, and that is to transfer resources to the family uh, to invest in the, in the in the child and. You're pursuing an experimental examination about that. Can you uh, describe that a little sure, bit? Sure, I'd be glad to. This is the 3,000th time that I've uh, done this because we're trying to raise a lot of money for it. But, um, you know, I think people tend to think of programs in a compartmentalized way uh, when they're thinking about how to ensure that there's equal opportunity for disadvantaged kids. So they're either thinking about parenting programs or they're thinking about early education programs. Um, or uh, less frequently, they're thinking about uh, income safety net kind of programs. And if you look um, over the last 20 years or so since welfare reform, uh, one of the striking things is, uh, is kind of growing inequality within the low income population, where we've really gone from a system that provided um, substantial support regardless of uh, the mother's employment status um, to a system that uh, rewards work very substantially. Our earned income tax credit pays up to $7,000 per year to families, uh, depending on their income, that work, right? People who aren't, aren't working aren't getting any of those benefits. Um, so uh, you're getting this, uh, this um, group of people who are connected to the labor market who are doing okay, and people who aren't regularly connected to the market uh, who aren't. Uh, and there's kind of growing research that the kind of instability that families are experiencing uh, when uh, there might be an eviction, there might be a utility cutoff, um, a, a sickness on the part of a child or a, 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 another relative might really disrupt things. So there's no sort of uh, cushion uh, that all other peer countries uh, provide in the form of child allowances. Most other countries are providing a modest monthly uh, allowance per child to all families with kids. And even in those other countries, often the families uh, multi generation live uh, in close proximity, whereas in the U.S., often people are scattered widely. And so, the extent to which that is can be a safety net for for right. uh, people in these uh, situations is also. Uh, probably relatively less than other Right, right. It adds to the, to the instability. Um, so, you know, the literature suggests that, um, that child uh, outcomes, especially child achievement, uh, improves with more income. Uh, that income might indeed be the active ingredient. There are a lot of things that are associated with income that are probably important too, like family structure and things like that. But, um, but we wanted to try to test uh, whether in the very early years when kids' brains are being wired up very rapidly and the family is all important relative to labor and schools and neighborhoods and other influences matter, that infancy, toddlerhood, the, the first three years of life, um, would the provision of a steady monthly allowance, income supplement to families, um, produce uh, more stable family processes and better child outcomes. So we have finally raised the money that we need to launch uh, an experiment, a random assignment experiment, where we're recruiting uh, a thousand mothers uh, in four different sites around the country, New York and St. Paul and Omaha and New Orleans. Mm -hmm. Some of them with partners, some without? Uh, they, the only requirement is that they had to have an income below the official poverty line, which is about $22,000 for a family of three in the calendar year before the birth. So we recruit them in the hospitals. They've just given birth. Um, and, uh, and then we administer a, a baseline questionnaire, but then um, give them the opportunity to receive a gift uh, and it turns out that the gift will be randomly assigned to either be $20 a month for 40 months or $333 a month, right? So it's $4,000 a year versus $2,040 a year. And it's that contrast between those two groups 
um, that is really fueling the experiment. And we'll be following them for at least uh, 40 months, measuring uh, what is happening in the family, what they're spending the money on, uh, stress levels. Uh, we're going to be assessing the quality of the parent-child interaction. You know, you name it. Uh, if it might be something that might be affected by income, and in turn explain why the kids in the higher income families might end up uh, doing better. We're going to be measuring that. And when you say stress levels, uh, we're not talking about the old fashioned, uh, here's five questions on a survey. Uh, no, we're talking about the, the newfangled saliva, <laughs> which uh, provides uh, cortisol, which is a stress hormone. And, uh, and if you set it up in the right kind of way, you can, uh, and it turns out you can get uh, cortisol in hair. Uh, and it gives you kind of a time series of, uh, of stress levels over the last several months, provided the hair is long enough. Yeah, and if, it, and if you're really under stress, <laughs> that method is, is uh, yeah, inoperative. Though. Right, right, right. But, um, but the focus is really on whether uh, kids will end up at 36 months uh, being different in terms of their cognitive development and behavioral development. So uh, at 36 months, uh, all the kids will come into labs uh, in these four sites. And in addition to the kind of conventional um, IQ tests and uh, behavioral kind of batteries, uh, we'll be putting uh, EEG caps, nets, on their heads and measuring elect electrical activity in their brains with the idea that um, 36 months is about the time when uh, children start to acquire um, some degree of self-regulation uh, when some impulse hits their amygdalas uh, and they want to hit the kid who just hit them, the free prefrontal cortex can kick in and say, well, let's think about it and, uh, and maybe that's not the best idea, right? So the, it's a time when those cross-region connections get wired up uh, and supposedly, I'm not a neuroscientist, but we've got a terrific neuroscientist uh, in our group, um, one may well be able to detect differences in the strength of those interregional kind of connections with this uh, with this EEG uh, methodology. Yeah, and the so the hypothesis there is that it's uh, those measures uh, will be uh, an indication of things like executive function, self-regulation, uh, more than say uh, um, cognitive ability uh, in in traditional academic uh, realm. Yeah, we'll be measuring both kinds of things, <laughs> measuring executive function behaviorally. But the idea is that, uh, that brain structure changes may precede uh, behavioral changes. So uh, we want to be able to see if um, either or both will show up as differences between kids in this high income condition and kids in the lower income condition number of cases where you can also look for um, variation amongst uh, groups in, in the, the treatment and control sample, right? To some extent. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a thousand uh, moms um, and you know once you start slicing and dicing and getting into subgroups um, you start to lose statistical power mm -hmm. uh, and differences have to be really quite big. Mm -hmm. So we're we're really gearing uh, it up to uh, detect the main differences between the high and low income uh, kids, um, but to the extent possible, um, looking at different, um, uh, well, male-female uh, differences and race and ethnic differences. There are a set of things. We, you know, we pick the sites to, um, to vary as much as possible along dimensions like uh, generosity of the safety net. Uh, so um, Louisiana has very low levels of benefits and Nebraska not pretty low. You know, with New York and uh, Minnesota, uh, we have much more generous. Cost of living is much higher in New York. So, you know, you could speculate that, well, 3000 or $4,000 a year won't make that much difference in New York City because mm -hmm. it's so expensive. But, you know, maybe... Um, it's also a place where the safety debt's higher, and maybe that provides kind of the base upon which supplemental income really makes a difference. Or maybe it's uh, New Orleans. 
right? Their benefits are very, very low. And the $4,000 that we pay is going to make uh, a much bigger difference in, in family income than it would in their work. Right. And there's also a, has to be variation in family dynamics about whether or not these supplementary resources are going to actually be targeted uh, as you would hope in uh, um, uh, creating more conducive um, settings for, for child rearing as opposed to being redirected to other. Right. Um, we don't condition uh, the income. Uh, we're not requiring that they uh, spend it on, yeah. on their kids. Um, and you're going to try to measure some of that, right? Yeah, now, that's right. That's right. We know what the expenditure categories are, but we also want this to be um, maximally um, informing policy debates at state government level, federal government level. We, we talk all the time about reducing these days or sometimes expanding benefits. And when you're providing more or less resources to families, people are worried about whether the moms are working more or less, but kids aren't in the discussion, mm -hmm. right? So we really want debates about changes in resources um, to be informed by evidence about what are the implications for, for kids. So that's, um, th that hasn't been the case before because there really hasn't been experimental evidence. And you know, once you start a policy debate, you have different sides citing different evidence and nothing's definitive. So we're really trying to be um, the first to produce definitive evidence here. And uh, you know, I know you're motivated uh, by improving policy and, and you're also on the, uh, chairing this National Academy report that's uh, uh, rare. It's because it's, it's both congressionally mandated and bipartisan in, uh, in a time where bipartisan approaches to, to policy uh, of this character are incre increasingly rare. Can you, can right. you talk about the, the, uh, the charge of that committee? Right, and right. The, so the National Academy of Sciences um, is an independent body that uh, was established by Abraham Lincoln back in uh, 1863. Um, and its mission is really to, uh, to inform the nation uh, about key questions that it might have for scientists. And uh, m many of the studies that come out of the National Academy come from Congress. And in this case, it was a, um, uh, a congressional mandate for the National Academy of Sciences to uh, develop ideas for reducing child poverty in half in 10 years. This is the kind of goal that uh, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown uh, set up in uh, Great Britain back in the mid 90s. Uh, and they accomplished that goal, actually. Um, we've never had that kind of goal. Uh, and we've got programs. You know, the, setting aside the war and poverty, right? Uh, yeah, but right. So, right, that was eliminating poverty, right? Mm -hmm. So that was, right. You're, Reminding me of my uh, my uh, old age, right? Well, or you know, I, I'm married to an historian, as right, you know, Greg. So right. I, I have to uh, make sure the record is straight there. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think Bob Bradley was the first presidential, the last presidential candidate to actually have poverty mm -hmm. reduction as a goal. Yeah. Um, so uh, there's a group uh, in Congress that's trying to bring that back, focus attention on it. So the question is, um, if you look around to policies that we have, policies we could have, policies that peer countries have developed, um, bringing in the different kind of values that people have, should they be work-based, um, what are some ideas, right, that uh, in combination would accomplish this 50% poverty reduction goal. So when an academy panel is set up, it usually runs for a year and a half or two years and um, has a number of meetings. Uh, we're kind of in the midst of that process now. We're hoping that our report will come out by September of this year. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun too because mm -hmm. it's about 12 or 13 people usually on the committee. They're chosen to be very diverse um, and uh, they're required to um, sift through the evidence and come up with conclusions and recommendations that can all be rigorously supported by evidence. There's a very elaborate review process that these reports go through. 
you you know this right mm -hmm. uh and um well that part you know, the part that it's evidence-based in uh in scientific in character um is standard with these uh, national academy reports but this this chore this charge that it's got to be bipartisan in character you know is more of a charge that's aligned to norms and values like you said and uh right right that's right. a more that's a more challenging piece of the mandate to try and figure out things that will be appealing to both sides of the, of the, of the right. political. So, you know, we have on the committee um, two uh, people who served in Republican administrations, uh, Ron Haskins, who works at the uh, Brookings Institution, Don Winstead, who ran the uh, Florida State uh, Department of Human Services, um, and also served in the George W. Bush cab cabinet or not cabinet, but in the Health and Human Services Department. Um, and they, um, you know, they have different values than uh, uh, some of the other people, but, um, but everyone is kind of bought into this uh, evidence-based requirement. And, uh, and if you might have a idea for a program, but there really is no evidence to support that it will actually work, then it doesn't make the list. I think this is great, the description of, of your academic work. Uh, that we've had, so I want to turn just a little bit towards the end of this conversation and uh, ask a little bit more personal uh, questions about kind of how you got here. And so, uh, what motivated you to pursue a PhD in economics in the first place? And then what motivated you to, to think about uh, childhood poverty and education as, as core uh, core interest for you to uh, spend your life uh, studying? You know, I think it could be traced back to a really good economics teacher in my college. I went to Grinnell College. Okay, well, we have to name him since we... Uh, uh, Bill Pollack is his name. Um, you know, not a, a, a famous no. uh, economist, but um, he loved a small college kind of setting. Uh, he was very... Uh, open to uh, interacting with students, and uh, I just I enjoyed that uh, immensely. And then I had an opportunity in my senior year to do a um, a year of research uh, as part of a field study program in Costa Rica, uh, which was uh, involved uh, working on an economics type project, um, marketing of basic agricultural products, and you know. What I was learning in the classroom seemed to be uh, playing out when we were doing our research. Um, so economics seemed to be an interesting uh, area. I was going to be a theorist. That was my uh, that was my plan, uh, and I went to the University of Michigan for my PhD. Um, you know, the theorist part lasted about a year, uh, but then I became interested in uh, the um, Institute for Social Research, and I started working there as a graduate student. Uh, on this big project that was focused on poverty. Um, so uh, that was in the midst of the war on poverty, so the early 70s. And, um, and we were sitting on and producing this trove of data that was following families year after year for, we're still doing it. Uh, and it was just a unique Panel set of Panel study data. of income dynamics. Right. Uh, one of the, the great, great social science resources uh, um, in the field today. And to be in a position of, you know, we were releasing it to other people, but when you're working on a project, you know the data much better than anyone else. So uh, it, it, I began uh, looking at uh, income trajectories and intergenerational uh, uh, welfare receipt and things like that. Um, and then just became interested in uh, what the effect of all that was on kids and struck up collaborations with very good uh, developmental psychologists. Uh, and then uh, that was the 90s, right? And uh, had been fortunate to be involved with a number of research networks uh, where I've learned a lot. But I've always, you know, I remember uh, one of the meetings, first research uh, network meetings that I had uh, at the Social Science Research Council. It was a, a committee that was formed after Bill Wilson wrote his book about the truly disadvantaged. And uh, very prominent sociologists and psychologists sitting around the table. And 
I didn't understand a word that they were saying. Uh, and, but I stuck with it, right? And gradually uh, you start to understand the vocabulary. Uh, you start to be able to translate. You know, when they say uh, moderation, uh, you think interaction. So same thing, right? But just two different words. Um, and so, you know, I stuck with it and uh, I've been uh, glad that I have because, um, you know, I think the kind of developmental perspective on kids um, is totally absent, almost totally absent in economics. We just think of kids as kind of small adults uh, mm -hmm. who are making decisions just like adults would. Uh, so um, it's been a very rich kind of perspective to bring to bear and try to meld together with the economic perspective. And that's, uh, that's been a lot of fun. So I very much appreciate you sharing uh, a little bit about your research and uh, your personal trajectory and your advice for PhD students, incoming PhD students. And uh, let me just say in closing uh, how honored I am to come to UCI and to have you as a colleague here, Greg. Well, let's cook, cook something up together. It's been a lot of fun. <laughs>